Thank you for joining us today here at Shepherd's Grove. We love you and we want you to know we're there for you all the way. Whatever it is you're going through, we're with you. And uh, we say this creed together. Would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving? We're going to say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I'm the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. So you may notice I'm wearing a robe, and uh, I want to just say a few things about that before I begin my message this morning. Um, when I was ordained as a pastor, there were all of these men of God I loved, and they, they came around, and my dad actually led the service, and they laid hands on me and prayed for me, and I wore this robe when that happened. And the robe became, and always has been, a sign of the idea that the person who is speaking has been affirmed by his, his or her community, has been educated, and has been prepared to, to do the task that God is at hand. This type of robe was put together in its roots by the Reformed doctors who wanted a sort of depth, or I don't want to say severity, but sacredness in the approach to serving the Word of God and the sacraments. So this robe has been worn by Dutch Reformed Presbyterian churches for centuries. And with the contemporizing of the church, many of the vestments and traditions that have us rooted in a history have been abandoned in many parts because of the fear of religiosity and posturing. And some of those points really are valid. And yet on the other hand, I still see plenty of religiosity and posturing by cool pastors in jeans and t-shirts. So posturing is much more to do with the heart than it does with clothing. One of the big reasons I'm wearing this robe is because I want to be rooted in something deeper than myself, in a way. I am rooted in deep, something deeper than myself, and we all are. And it's a reflection not of me as a person, but of the office that I didn't create, an office I inherited. And it's a way for me, as Paul says, to lift or raise the office to which I've been called. On a personal note, all the men of God in my life that I looked up to, most of them wore the same vestment, the pastors. My dad, we had a, a lot of people are like, what's it like growing up at the Christ Cathedral? I didn't grow up at the Christ Cathedral. I, I grew up at Rancho Capistrano Community Church, Dutch Reformed Church on a hill and on the sunny brown green hills of San Juan Capistrano. And uh, we were there and, you know, every Sunday we had a choir and my dad would come down wearing a robe like this and he would preach the word of God. And he, would, he always did this thing with children where he would sit down on the steps with kids and give them toys. And they're such fond memories. And we would go outside and have chili cook-offs and stuff. And when we came up to the Crystal Cathedral, the men of God there like Tino Ballestero and Juan Carlos and my grandpa and Glenn and Jim and so many of the other pastors, men and women, wore the vestments as well as they would preach and administer the word and sacraments. My parents were also divorced, and I went to church my whole life, but when I was with my mom, we lived in L.A., and we went to Hollywood Presbyterian, and so I would watch Lloyd Ogilvie preach in the exact same robe as well. And later on, we attended different churches uh, that also had a huge impact on my life, mostly charismatic Pentecostal churches. But it's weird because that's really my life. I'm this odd combination of traditional Presbyterian Dutch Reformed, but also Pentecostal. And I'm this weird mishmash of the two. I think one of the main reasons I'm wearing this particular robe is that it, this is my grandpa's robe. It is the robe he wore. My grandpa, you know, I'm very close to my grandma and grandpa personally are here today. I'm very, very close with them. But I was also very close with my grandma and grandpa Schuler. Both of them have passed. And when I was a young college pastor with my grandpa Schuler, we would sit up in his office and he mentored me for years. Every Thursday I'd be up there for hours and he would pour into me and he'd ask me questions and this and that. And I, I really idolized him. I really looked up to him. And I disagreed with him. I loved challenging him and pushing back. And I loved it when I, he didn't have an answer and would just smile. He'd just go... <laughs> <laughs> and 
and uh, he died two years ago, he gave me this robe. And he, he gave it to me because he wanted me to wear it. Excuse me. It seems... <laughs> Seems uh, wrong to let it sit in a closet. Excuse me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep wearing the robe, and if it bugs you. Uh, if it, uh, if it bugs you, just pretend I'm giving a graduation speech and then you'll just get over it, you know? <laughs> if it really bugs you, you can come to our modern service where I'll be, be a little bit more casual. So, anyway, well, good morning. We're so glad you're here, and I'm so thankful that uh, you're here to worship with us. And, and Shepherd's Grove is a church that really believes in people. Whatever it is you're going through right now, I, I really want you to know that the shame you feel, because we all feel it, we call shame different things. We call it um, embarrassment. We call it uh, not good enough. We call it unworthy. We, we sh shroud it in pretending. I want you to know that here you can be safe. You can be exactly who you are. You don't have to wear masks in this church. You're loved just as you are and, and not for what you should be. And not just by God, but by us. We love you very, very much. And we believe that this is the right kind of place. We believe the hour of power will always be a place where people can receive encouragement every day, be realigned with what God says and not what the world says, because the world can be really harsh. And uh, we receive from God the good news that we are called, that we are beloved, that we're worthy, that we're talented. The possibilities of life are limitless. And that's a very good thing. The world, the world needs you. Today we're beginning a series where we're going to talk about what Jesus said about life Every couple of years, I, I was, you know, I, I love the Sermon on the Mount. I, I studied it for years and years. I've translated it from Greek to English. I, I studied under Dallas Willard, who was also a big Sermon on the Mount guy. And, I, and, and so I love to preach it, and, but I've done it to death in a way, you know. So I'm going to try it and in this series, pull from the Gospels a lot, but I'm going to move off of Matthew a bit. And we're going to talk about how Jesus gives you the opportunity to be totally alive. That when Jesus talks about eternal life, he's not just talking about going to heaven when you die, and he is talking about that, but he's also talking about how to be totally alive today. I want that, you want that too. And he gives us a, a roadmap for that. And so we're going to spend the next few months actually studying that on how to be alive. Yeah, that's right. It's the narrow path. <laughs> How to be alive. Jesus begins in the Sermon on the Mount by affirming that everyone in his audience is called, loved, powerful, and valuable. Now this was remarkable in his day because the religious people in Jesus' day like to say some people are out and some people are in. And the way that you get in is by doing things the right way and not being sick. I hate to say that. But people like lepers and, uh, and people with bleeding diseases were believed to be cursed by God because of a sin of their parents or something like that. So there was this system in place where some people were in and some people were out. Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 5. And he begins with the Beatitudes in which he says that everyone belongs. He begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is not a virtue. That's a misunderstanding of the passage. Poor in spirit means you're spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are you if you mourn. Blessed are you if you've been a doormat your whole life. And Luke, he says, blessed are you if you're poor, if you're persecuted, if you're unwanted, if you're uninvited. Jesus says to these people, you are called, you are loved, you are light, you are salt. Now, I, I want to hang on that just for a minute. Many of us, we think that God always calls the brightest and the best. In 1 Samuel, uh, the people of Israel don't have a king. They have judges and they have 
But they, they always say God is our king. And, and in the story, the Jewish people decide one day that they want a king. And they pick this guy, Saul. Saul is regal. He's tall. He's, he's handsome. He's kingly. He looks, acts, and sounds just like a king. They make him king. And he, and he becomes a tyrant. He becomes an evil guy. He treats people poorly. And uh, he's a terrible king. And then God tells Samuel, I'm going to call a new king. So he says, Samuel, go to Bethlehem, incidentally, where the family of the Jesses are. You know, Jesse is, Jesse's household is there. So go to Jesse's house. And when he arrives, Samuel the prophet, everyone in Bethlehem is scared because back then prophets weren't always bringing good news. And they said, are you here to condemn us? And he said, no, we're going to make a sacrifice together, which essentially means we're going to have a party. We're going to have a party and make a sacrifice to God. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I always believe that Samuel did this party sacrifice thing as a, a bit of a veil, a guise, to snoop around Jesse's family and see who the king was. Samuel was led by the Holy Spirit and was supposed to discern by listening and, and feeling from the Holy Spirit who this next king was, you know? So Jesse comes and he brings his son and he sees the eldest son, Eliab. And he looks at Eliab and he, the Bible says, he, he looks and says, surely this is God's anointed. Because Eliab was tall, he was handsome, he was the eldest. He had all the things that made him look kingly. And the Bible says this, God said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. So one at a time, all of these sons were brought before Samuel. And he keeps thinking, this is the one. And God says, no, that's not him. That's not him. That's not him. And finally, he thinks he's gone through all the sons. And Samuel says to Jesse, the dad, is this it? Are these all your sons? And it always breaks my heart, Jesse's response. He says, oh, it kind of scratches his head and goes, well, there's, I mean, I guess there's David. I mean, just hold on to that for a second. A big honor, a big celebration, a big party in a little town. If you've ever lived in a little town, a big party is a big deal. The fair comes to town or something like that, everyone wants to go. David was obviously told, stay back, take care of the sheep. All of your brothers and I are going to the sacrifice. You get to stay. He's uninvited. Obviously, his you know, brothers and dad don't see a whole lot in him. And Samuel says, we will not sit down until he is here. And when David comes... He's the chosen one because of his heart. And by the way, the heart is not all about emotions. In the Bible, the heart is about will. It's about what you choose to do. It's about courage. It's about being the one that in spite of not being the tallest, the best looking, the most regal, you say, yes, Lord, I say yes, I will do what you call me to do. It's about the heart. And uh, David is anointed. And it says, when he was anointed, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and remained with him. David was not a perfect guy. David made lots of mistakes, was even, in a way, a murderer. And in spite of that, God continued to use him to do a lot of good in, in the world. I don't have time to get into that story and explain why, but it's important to know that in our lives, we think of all sorts of reasons why God can't use us. We think of all of our flaws and sins and mistakes and we explain to God over and over, God, you don't understand. I can't do that. Don't you know who I am? And you know what God says to you? He says, I know exactly who you are. You're my beloved child. You have everything it takes. You have everything you need, your salt and your light, and the world needs you. And I guess that's what I want to get across to you today. Very often in church we talk about how God loves us and God wants us and God but sometimes that can feel like, well, God wants us, but the world wants nothing to do with us. Or the world can, can, you know, doesn't need us. But Jesus says to these people, okay, so go back to the scene. Here's Jesus on a hill. And there's thousands of people. And most of them are riffraff and vagabonds and ragamuffins and all sorts of old terms that 
and he says to these outcasts who are not religious, who are probably there to get a miracle or see something cool happen, and he just says to them, you are light and you are salt. Something I really want to point out here. Notice how Jesus doesn't say to them, if you believe in me, you'll become the light of the world. I mean, it's true, we got to believe in Jesus, but he doesn't say that. And he doesn't say, work hard and become the light and the salt of the earth. Or he doesn't say, if you, if you read the Bible, or if you do everything I tell you to do, then you'll be salt and light. What does he do? He just says, you are salt. You are light. And so I want to say to you that God is declaring that over you. Not that it's going to be so, but he needs you to know what's already there, that you're already salt you're already light. You already have it in you. Just release it. Let it go. Open it up. Give it to the world. The world needs your salt and your light. The most important thing to know is that Christ is affirming in you how valuable you are. You're extremely valuable. And in the same way a town needs salt to exist and to eat, the world needs you. You're so valuable. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You have to ask yourself, have I lost my saltiness? Sounds like a pirate, doesn't it? Yar, salty pirate. <laughs> have I lost my saltiness? Am I, I am salt, but am I being salty? Am I releasing the, all the flavor and the enthusiasm and, and the, the value that makes me who I am? You are salt, so be salty. And he says, you are light. And the light is, is knowledge, but light also in the Bible really is about being powerful. You know the old axiom, knowledge is power. Well, that was certainly true for the philosophical Jews and Greeks. They, they equated knowledge and power. So being light is a combination of both being powerful and being wise or being knowledgeable. And he says, that's you have knowledge? You, you have treasures in you that are so valuable. You're light. You're powerful. You're salt. You have everything this world needs to be better. You want to leave it better because God's called you to make it better. And one of the greatest things about this passage in Matthew is that the guy writing is a tax collector. And tax collectors are at the very bottom of the rung. They were thieves. They had sided with the Roman Empire. They were outsiders. Tons of shame. And Matthew, the tax collector, is writing about the Sermon on the Mount. And he's listening, going, I'm not salt. I'm not light. And in the next chapter, Jesus walks up to Matthew and he says, You, Matthew, come follow me. You can almost see him knock over his table. He says, Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you anywhere you'll go. What an honor. Maybe you're like Matthew. Maybe you come here today and you go, I'm not salt. I'm not light. Bobby, you don't know what I've done. Or, Bobby, you don't know how bad I've messed up. Or, Bobby, I'm, I'm too old, or I'm not educated enough, or I'm too young. Or, uh, I, I've tried over and over, and I just keep failing. Friend, I want you to know, God is affirming today in your life. Your salt and your light and your best days are yet to come. Don't give up your hope. Don't throw away your tomorrow. Good things are coming. Amen? Amen. Amen. You are salt and light. You are you are salt and light. Confess it. Proclaim it. Believe it. Own it. The world needs you. What do you confess over yourself? Do you catch yourself? I mean, like, how often do we say, I'm such an idiot. Of course I messed up. I'm totally stressed out. I'm so worried. I'm, you know, these types of things. It's good to be vulnerable and it's good to talk about our feelings, but I'm talking about the ways in which we kind of compulsively say it. We're not sitting down with a cup of tea, opening up to a friend. We're just blurting out negative stuff all the time, negative confessions about ourselves and others. Stop doing that. Confess your sins, confess your mistakes, be vulnerable, be open, but don't just always compulsively say bad things about yourself. In fact, I would love for you to take a risk and one of these days when you're feeling stressed, just say something like, I'm feeling pumped, or <laughs> I don't know what you'd say. I, I'm feeling relaxed, or I, I, uh, I am the salt of the light, I'm the salt of the earth, I'm, I'm the light of the world. It feels weird even saying it, doesn't it? But that's what God says over you. Confess it. Not long ago, Hannah and I 
you maybe you're in a valley in your life. Hannah and I were in Switzerland, and I took this cool picture. We, we'd always wanted to go here. We saw it on Pinterest. So we found it, this little house that is built on the side of a mountain. And actually, the right side of that house is actually a mountain wall. So Hannah and I had to actually climb up there. You see all the snow. It was actually mid-June, I think, late June. And the next day, we almost got snowed in. It's only open during the summer. And it's very, very high in the Swiss Alps. And what that is is actually, it's kind of like a glorified campground. So they have these little houses all over the Alps where mountaineers and hikers can stay the night and get shelter from, from the snow and, and won't you know, die in it in something. <laughs> the amazing thing is they had a bunch of food and beer. And I asked them, where did you get all this beer and sausages and stuff? Helicopter comes and drops it in. <laughs> anyway, that was cool. I digress. But this is up from a little village called Oppenzell. We were, we were there doing ministry because of our Swiss office, and so we decided to take a few days extra. And it's a mountaineering town. And one of the things I noticed is that there's two people in the little mountaineering village. There's the villagers who are just always there. They're doing life. They're never going up in the mountains. And then there's the other person. There's the mountaineer in the valley. And the reason they're there is not to be bored and sit around and do nothing. They're there to prepare for the next climb. In other words, there's two people in the valley. There's some who are complacent or stuck or in the rut. And then there's another type of person in the valley, the mountaineer who's preparing. The mountaineer who's getting the right tools, putting the plans together, who's meeting the right people, maybe training or resting. And where you are in your life, you may say, Bobby, I've been in this valley for a long time. And I just want to say to you, you're in a time of preparation. You're not like the villagers who are going to be stuck there. You're the mountaineer that even though you're not on a mountain, you're getting the right tools. You're meeting the right people. You're resting. You're getting everything you need to get to the top. And I want to just say to you that God is going to bring you up to the mountain. If you're on the top of the mountain right now, nobody stays on top of the mountain, right? Unless you're dead. The only people who stay on top of the mountain are dead people. So life is that ebb and flow. There's the up and downness of mountains, like, like the waves. The life is always a series of achievement and then letting go of your achievement so that you can achieve the next thing that God has for you. And that's a really great thing. So as we talk about how to be alive, we have to know that we are salt. You are salt. You're light. And the world needs you. And the world will truly miss out if you keep beating yourself up, bullying yourself, shaming yourself, comparing yourself to others, comparing yourself to your past, confessing negative things about yourself. It's time to change what you say, to confess positive things, to have a bigger outlook on your life, to not be overwhelmed by the big picture, but to just take small practical steps towards your destiny and to trust in God with everything you do. Amen? Well, before we finish today, I always like to give everyone an opportunity to connect with God. And so I'm going to actually, today is a great day, you know, to become a Christian. What better day than today, right? We're thinking about the whole year is ahead of us. And maybe you're here today and you think, I, you know, Christians, I, if Christians are so religious or they're mean or they're judgmental. Those people are bad Christians. They're not the... They're not the good kind, you know. And the, the world needs good Christians, like people that are not the bad kind, you know. And, and they need someone like you. And today is a fantastic day to become a Christian. So you know, with everybody looking around, every head up, everybody just observing, I want to give you the opportunity today to become a believer. You say, Bobby, I, I, this is embarrassing. I don't want to be in front of all these people to do this. Look. The cool thing about becoming a Christian is it begins with an act of courage. And how much more courageous than to stand up in front of a thousand people and come down and confess Jesus Christ. Are you at peace with God today? Are you at peace with yourself? If you need new life, I'm going to ask you now, right now, stand up and come down here and let me pray for you. Just in front of everybody. Who cares? You don't need to be cool. Just stand up right where you are, right in front of whoever it is, and come on down. <laughs> Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. I'm not here to condemn you. 
I'm here to love on you, to give you grace, and to give you an opportunity that when the day comes, when you breathe your last, that you know with confidence that you belong to Jesus Christ. And you know where you're going. And to dedicate your life to, to serving him and loving him. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So you want it? Come get it. It's a free gift. Thank you, friends. So we're going to pray together. And uh, would you hold your hands out like this? And can I ask, the, do we have a, pastors and leaders? Uh, and um, I want you to say this with me. And church, maybe when I became a Christian, I, I had an offer to come down and I didn't actually go down, but I made a decision to believe in God that day. So maybe wherever you are, you're saying, I still want to make this decision. Let's all say this together. Would you, everyone, hold your hands out like this and repeat after me. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I am now the righteousness of Christ. I am loved. I am forgiven. I am belong. I am called. And I am favored. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. And teach me to be like Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, guys. You are loved. You are called. You are blessed. You are above and not beneath. You are the head and not the tail. And so now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is moving in miraculous ways through Hour of Power, thanks to our faithful Eagle partners who provide the foundational support our ministry needs, we're able to continue sharing God's love and dignity with the world. Please prayerfully consider becoming an Eagle partner today with a monthly gift of $50 or a one-time gift of $600. As a thank you for your gift, Bobby will send you our recent book, Releasing Joy. This leather-bound 52-week devotional book features inspirational scripture and teachings from Bobby for every week of the year. As a Golden Eagle partner with your gift of $100 a month or a one-time gift of $1,200, Bobby will send you a copy of Releasing Joy with your name beautifully embossed on the cover. Your steadfast support enables our ministry to maintain and extend its reach around the world. Call, write, or go online to become an Eagle Partner today. We are so thankful for you.